Now we discussed this water-cooled heat exchanger a lot more detail on the condenser side, but we can also use this very same coil to transfer heat on the evaporator side. In other words, I could run refrigerant through here at a low pressure saturated mixture. That refrigerant running on the outside as it circles through, that refrigerant is boiling, changing state from a liquid to a vapor. Then we pull our vapor back on the other side, back to the compressor. I could have my fluid running on the inside of this pipe here. So as my fluid's running through this type, let's see water or a glycol or any kind of a antifreeze style mixture, I could absorb heat away from that water. So one question students ask is why do you want to absorb heat away from the water? Well, later we're going to talk about heat pumps. And what I can do is I can absorb heat out of the water and the cooler water leaves and goes, let's say through a bunch of tubes inside of the earth. So the earth heats that water back up. And then as that water comes back over here, I use my refrigerant to absorb the heat out of water. I can then put that heat into the house. We can also use these for many other things as a chilled water system. There's many things that we can use to chill water, such as a water fountain or a water cooler. We're simply taking heat out of water. In those cases, we just simply dump that heat into the air. You can also see a heat exchanger such as this. Here we have our two water pipes for a water run in and back out. I don't think it's as directional. But at the bottom, we have a pipe here. Very bottom down here, this is our refrigerant pipe coming in. And at the very top is our suction pipe coming out. So our metering device would be before this. So we enter into this tank as a low temperature saturated mixture. The refrigerant boils from a liquid to vapor and then comes out as a superheated vapor. The refrigerant comes in here at the very bottom. It's coming in as a low temperature saturated mixture after the metering device. So the refrigerant comes in here and starts boiling from a liquid to a vapor. And then the vapor comes out the very top here at the suction side. Where we see all these tubes, these are our fluid tubes. Well, here we see our water pipes, our glycol pipes. Our water's coming in and it's circling around and around and around and around. And there's another set of coils here at the very top. And it's going back around and around and around and again. And it's exiting back out. So we are essentially taking heat out of the fluid that's inside these tubes and moving it to the refrigerant that's on the outside of these tubes but the inside of this shell. So the refrigerant is boiling, changing state from liquid to vapor. They also add all these little ridges on here to help transfer heat a lot faster. What is also cool about this is there's a little plate inside of here. And this little plate's cool because it helps make sure that we don't get any liquid refrigerant back to the compressor. So as that refrigerant's over here boiling, changing state from liquid to vapor, suction pipe that drops down and it's at an angle here, this helps protect us from getting any liquid refrigerant boil straight into that suction pipe. But also because it's cut here at an angle, if we do get a little bit of liquid refrigerant into this little plate, then we end up pulling mainly vapor in through that suction pipe. So it's a pretty cool design. And the idea is that we transfer heat from the fluid into the cooler temperature of the refrigerant. This is our heat exchanger or evaporator. Our metering device is mounted to the very bottom. So the refrigerant came in as a saturated mixture. The refrigerant boiled from a liquid to vapor, then superheated to vapor and came out to the top side, going back to the compressor as a low temperature, low pressure superheated vapor. On the other side here, we have our glycol comes into the very top side and then it comes out the bottom. Notice it's counter flow to the refrigerant. The refrigerant comes into the bottom and comes out the top. The glycol comes in the top and out the bottom. This is a braze style heat exchanger. What it means there's individual plates here. So that means through one of these plates, refrigerant's flowing through and another one you have the glycol flowing through. And then the next one will be refrigerant, the next one's glycol, and refrigerant and glycol. So it's a very efficient way of exchanging heat in a very short area. This one is actually leaking. We didn't know that until we got it cut open, but uh, it is leaking glycol. It wasn't leaking refrigerant, but it was leaking glycol. So this is a heat exchanger. It's also our evaporator. Pretty cool. So all that was suspended here. This is where we take the heat out of the glycol and put it into the refrigerant. We take heat out of the refrigerant and put it into the air. Here's our braised plate heat exchanger. Our refrigerant would be metered into the bottom. The refrigerant would boil, change state from a liquid to a vapor, and then it would come out to the top as a superheated vapor back to the compressor. Our glycol in this example would come in here at the top. The glycol runs through the coil and the glycol leaves at the bottom. This side over here would be our primary. This is where our refrigerant's running. And this one over here would be our secondary. This is what we we're trying to, the fluid we're trying to cool. In this case, a, a type of glycol. So here we see different colors. Where you see the blue, this is where the glycol would be running. So all of these chambers, notice that they're zigzagged back and forth. The blue everywhere, it's blue here, is where the glycol would be running. And then everywhere you see that it's shiny copper, that's where the refrigerant was running. So there's a lot of heat transfer, a lot of connections. Let's look at that another way. 
So if we cut this open this direction, now we can see a little bit different look on this, a little different viewpoint. We can see that this chamber back and forth is all blue, so that's where a glycol is running. The next one up is all shiny copper, that's where the refrigerator is running. And then the next one above that, again, is blue, and so on and so on. So there's a lot of heat transfer. There's a lot of the fluid, or in this case glycol, touching a lot of metal, and then there's a lot of metal touching a lot of refrigerant, and so on and so on all the way through. Here you can see another example. Here you can see where that pipe comes through, and you can see it all the way through. So these chambers here equaled up for the refrigerant side, they just go back and forth. This one's on a different set of chambers, so when I put the tool in here, you can't see it. So these are going on the outside. So here's the refrigerant running in this section, and since this is sealed, the glycol is running in a separate set of tubes. Let's look at this a little different way, because that can be still a bit complicated. The wonderful things you can find still on eBay. So this is an example of a plate heat exchanger. It's not a braised plate, but it's still a plate. And you can see inside through here, we have all of these tubes going through. So it looks like they're all connected, but they're really not. Let's open this up and we can see a little bit better idea how it works. This one is a display, so this opens up and we can see we have all of these individual plates through here. The other side would be completely capped. This is a demonstration used for fluid transfer, so it's a little different, but the idea is the same. Here we have our plates and we have our four holes. What I want you to see here is that the hole here and the hole here is completely sealed off by this gasket material. So there's no way for fluid to flow from this hole into the plate. But if you look on the other side, where this hole is connected, it's open to this plate and it can exit back on the other side. In our case, we're having refrigerant flow in and that refrigerant's evaporating, changing state for liquid to vapor and then coming back out the top. The very next plate we have is the opposite direction. Plate, we have our fluid coming in, so our glycol in this example would be coming in and it travels back and forth across this plate and it's gonna be exiting down at the bottom. So you can see how the gas material is open and then on this side of where the refrigerant would be, it is completely sealed off. So in this chamber right here, we would only be having the glycol flowing and between this chamber, there'd be only refrigerant flowing. So if we put these two together, you can see how between these two plates, we would have only refrigerant flowing. And then between this plate and the next plate, we would have only glycol flowing. And then this plate, again, we'd have only refrigerant flowing and so on as we stack this up. So the more plates that we have, the more heat exchange we have. Now this example is using gaskets, so it's a little different. This is for a fluid transfer, but it's still the idea works the same. This one over here is a braised style, so all of these are braised in because we can't allow gaskets to hold for our refrigerant. So these are a braised style heat exchanger, but it still works the same way. There's these individual plates, and this just goes a little step further. Notice all these little zigzags in there. That allows for more heat transfer, more travel. So we're able to transfer a lot of heat in a very, very small area. So it's a pretty cool little way of moving heat. We're just taking heat from a warmer place to a cooler place. And if we use refrigerant through here, the refrigerant boiling, changing state from a liquid to vapor, absorbs a massive amount of BTUs. But also, let's say, what if we wanted to run it a different way? Is there a different possibility? Let's say I wanted to run a cool temperature glycol through here and here. So my glycol would come in, it would transfer through this plate, and the glycol would come back out. So this glycol, let's say this glycol is at 25 degrees. If we look on the next plate, over here I could have another substance. In this case, let's say it's beer. I could have beer running through this plate and back out the other side. So now I can actually take and exchange the heat from the beer to the cooler glycol and it's nothing more than a heat exchanger. So in this case, we're using refrigerant, boiling refrigerant, but it can be fluid to fluid, and that wouldn't be an evaporator in that case, it would just simply be a heat exchanger. But this exact same heat exchanger can be used as an evaporator for refrigerant boiling, absorbing heat, or we can use it for two different substance chemicals. Anything you can think of. And this, this particular one came out of a glycol system for a beer cooler. It had refrigerant boiling. Refrigerant came in as a low temperature saturated mixture. It boiled from a liquid to vapor and it, exit, and it exited as a low temperature, low pressure superheated vapor. Our glycol came in fairly warm and we took the heat out of the glycol and the glycol came out cooled. But also we could do that same thing. I could run glycol through here at a lower temperature. The glycol would come out. A warmer fluid such as a soft drink or a beer or anything else through here. 
the heat would leave this warmer fluid, go to the cooler glycol, the beer or soft drink or whatever fluid would be coming out at a lower temperature here. It is nothing more than a heat exchanger. So hopefully it gives you a little idea of how some of these work. Here's yet another style of evaporator. This is called a plate evaporator. As refrigerant runs through on the back side of this, it's boiling, changing state from liquid vapor, absorbing a massive amount of heat. On this side of the heat exchanger, we're running water over this. And as we're running water over this, we're taking the heat out of water. And if I take enough heat out of water, the water will change state from a liquid to a solid, which is a type of latent heat. And we're gonna talk about ice here shortly. So we have several things about defrost and harvest cycles that we are able to get that ice back out. But what's very important is these fins, all this metal right here. This metal has to be slick so that the ice can harvest or fall off this heat exchanger during the harvest cycle. They are made to be, a, to be smooth so that during the harvest cycle, the ice will come out correctly. These plate style heat exchangers are done by design very specifically. They use a nickel coating right here that's food safe so that the nickel doesn't contaminate the ice, but also it keeps that nice and smooth. So during the harvest cycle, when you're ready for this ice to come off this heat exchanger and fall straight down, it will without a problem. If we use the wrong kind of cleaner on this heat exchanger, which happens all the time, unfortunately too many times, people use the wrong type of cleaner or the wrong amount of cleaner. And if you use the wrong type or the wrong amount of cleaner, you will end up eating away the nickel from this evaporator coil. And once you lose your nickel, you can't get your nickel back. Also, there's another type of cleaner that we use called the sanitizer, and if you mix the cleaner, the descaler, and the sanitizer, you will end up with a caustic chemical that will uh, be very bad. So you need to make sure before you work in ice machines, you take some ice machine classes and fully understand everything about ice machines. When we get to the commercial class, we're gonna go over ice machines, but specifically you need to take the classes for each individual manufacturer. There's tons and tons of tricks to these. Let's look at the evaporator side. Here you can see the back side of that evaporator coil and our refrigerants running back and forth in these different patterns that the manufacturer has figured out that's best for them. And so all we're doing is boiling that refrigerant from a liquid to a vapor, then we superheat the vapor and we come back out the other side. As we're absorbing heat, we're absorbing heat from the other side of the metal and absorbing heat away from that water. So one of the ones I'm missing is a chilled water system or a chilled water evaporator coil. And those are nothing more than this same type of concept, just very large, a whole lot bigger in size. But still the same idea goes. We absorb heat away from water and then from there we put the heat in the refrigerant. We raise the temperature and the pressure of that refrigerant and then I can reject the heat into the air directly or put the heat into water and then from the water go to the air. Now after I've chilled the water from the evaporator, taken the heat out of the water, that chilled water I can put through another type of heat exchanger. And that chilled water I can use and move air across it. I can take heat out of the air, put it into the water. From the water to the refrigerant, from the refrigerant to air or water again. So there's many different things we can do with this. I'm not wanting you to understand or memorize or learn all of these components. What I really want at this point in the course is for you to think about the bigger picture, about that refrigerant boiling from a liquid to vapor is simply absorbing heat. We can absorb heat from many different things, such as ice cream or beer or water or fluid or soft drinks or the air or ice or anything else. So if you're thinking about that movement of heat, you're thinking about those thermal dynamics, that's what's gonna get you to that next level, that bigger picture. So we don't need to worry about all these little details just yet, but ideally it's inspiring you to think about all the other things that we can do with refrigeration, with that refrigerant changing state from a liquid to vapor.